Hi, this is Lindsay Oden, Special Research Assistant at the Washington State Attorney General's Office, and this is your AGO Moment in History. In this series, our office will be releasing clips from our Oral History Project, an ongoing effort to collect and preserve the history of the Attorney General's Office as told by the people who have worked here over the years. In today's episode, Eikenberry specifically recounts ensuring women had more opportunities in the office, creation of the Criminal Justice Division, increased attention to consumer protection, and how the office solicited amicus briefs in order to aid the writing of AGO opinions. Let's take a listen. So, uh, let's talk some more about management challenges. And during your years as Attorney General, the office changed a lot. In fact, I would almost go out on a limb and say, in my experience with five attorneys general, it changed more during your tenure than any other attorney general. And one factor was growth. Yes. Uh, we went from uh, over 200 lawyers to close to 400 lawyers, I yes. believe. Yes. And so um, what, what led to that growth? And how did you um, meet the growing demands for legal service? Well, this um, your question goes back a little bit to uh, what I should have said in answering uh, Jeff's question about my relationship with governors, because to be candid, I came into office with the idea that uh, <laughs> we should get by with as little as we could, and because in the King County Prosecutor's Office, if we hired an additional attorney. What we did was go down to uh, St. Vincent de Paul, buy a desk, bring it back, and set it in the hallway, <laughs> and that's where the lawyer, yeah. that's where, where the lawyer operated. Whoa, that didn't work in the uh, day and age when uh, when I came into office as Attorney General, and so we kind of plugged away with I, th <laughs> we kind of plugged away with the budgets the legislature gave us in the first uh, term. Well, the only improvement being the technology of for computers. And uh, I've, we, I had kind of an arm's length relationship. Uh, I wouldn't call it hostile, but it was arm's length with Governor Spellman, the initial governor. Then when Governor Gardner came into office, Democrat, the other party, uh, he and his wife came out to uh, have lunch with uh, Dev and I and we hit it off pretty well, and then later on, uh, a month or so later, while we're doing the budget, well, maybe it was sooner than that, Ed Mackey, chief deputy, went over and struck a deal with the governor's office where they would use their money, and they would hire an auditing firm that they selected to look at what we were doing and how much we were paid and how much control we had over the case. And what they found out was that uh, we were underpaid, and they found out that the uh, client agencies had a habit of just dismissing it once it was in our hands, saying it was your case now. And uh, so they, they addressed both of those with improved salaries. In fact, my chief deputies and my deputies were making more money than I was because I had to go through a salary commission, and the deputies did not. And uh, the client agencies became much more circumspect, much more forthcoming in providing evidence and providing witnesses. And uh, I, I don't know if you experienced that in your work, but it seemed to me that our relationship was, was much better with the agencies. And you mentioned technology. That was a huge change. Oh. Uh, what? Uh, how did you convince the legislature to give us money for technology back in those days? Well, I, I think I started out the interview here by mentioning that one of our attorneys had uh, missed a, right. a, a deadline. Right. And I could see where we, we had the capacity for doing that multiple of times. Later on, it did happen, I guess. Not on, not on my watch, I'm glad to say. But uh, it seemed to me that correcting this, part of correcting this, was a matter of just simply knowing how many cases we had and where they were, who was resigned to them, and, and that sort of thing. And so that's what 
the uh, computerization made po uh, possible. Uh, I should tell you also that um, the struggle did not end with the initial gaining of the money. Uh, and what I mean by that is that there was a particular time when um, the um, office that, I can't remember what they called it, Office of Government Supply or something, uh, when, there, when they were after us to become part of their big server operation. And, and, but we said, no, we've got to have our individual computers up and operating because if that way, if the system goes down, we're not, everybody's not down. But also, we were fortunate in that the, literally, the law required that um, our new criminal prosecution authority, ability and authority would be uh, independent from the rest of the uh, computer operation. So that, anyway, that was um, an important part of keeping track of who was doing what and who was assigned to which and, and what dates they were meeting. Another uh, major change that you instituted was you moved women into management positions, and that had never happened before. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, we did make a point of it, simply on the grounds that uh, <laughs> there were so many women coming out of the law schools, for one thing. But also, uh, we felt like there was a very good case to be made that uh, the Attorney General's office was a great place for women lawyers to gain experience, to flourish and grow, and to then, if they wish, to go on to other things or stay in the office. So. Uh, we felt like we had an ideal situation. Yeah. Well, I owe you my. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm proud to say that uh, you, along with a number of others, we have uh, two. We have two uh, state Supreme Court justices yep. who were former attorneys general, and uh, many of in the Superior Court, and other public offices. And then there are people who successfully retired. And such as yourselves. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so let me talk about the criminal division for a minute because uh, uh, you you basically took the office into the realm of criminal law. Yes. And uh, tell us about how that came about. Well, um, it was almost a, based on a campaign issue in 1980 because... At that time, we did have uh, reported instances of um, arsons, uh, a tavern having been set afire and, and no prosecution, of uh, assaults, <coughs> an attempted murder of a liquor inspector, and no prosecution. And uh, so, and this was all happening in one county. So I felt it was an example of a need for um, the, someone to have the from at the state level to have the authority to come in and investigate and prosecute criminal activity. And as it turned out, uh, of course, that was uh, as that reasoning prevailed. Although I have to say that uh, in the process of getting the bill through the legislature, one of our biggest stumbling blocks were the prosecuting attorneys in various counties who saw it as a challenge to their th authority. And of course, uh, it was not intended that way, and as it turned out, the initial cases were didn't work out to be that at all. Uh, one case I remember from Yakima was uh, involved in the, t uh, the prosecuting attorney's family or something of that sort, and uh, he was being accused of going easy on a case where the de prospective defendant had said that the victim was kicked in the head by a horse. And uh, we took over that case, and yeah, it turned out that uh, we used a uh, federal government employee who was able to testify that the imprint on the woman's head was not that of a horse. <laughs> <laughs> it was that of a two-before. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> And up in uh, in the Isle in San Juan County, we took over the uh, prosecution of a case where there was no body. 
the interesting thing about that case is that the new high-level bridge over the Duwamish, or not the Duwamish, up in Seattle. It's anyway, Sp Spokane, Spokane Bridge. Spokane yeah, Street Bridge yeah. yeah, the Spokane Bridge should be named after Captain Walt Neslin, yeah. the victim in that case, <laughs> yeah. because he's the one who piloted a ship into uh, into the bridge. Interesting thing about that to, to me was that um, at the office I was in, a private civil office I had been in in Seattle, represented the Pilots Association. Mm. So I had a uh, strong interest in that case. Yeah, yeah. And then another area that you got involved heavily in was the civil commitment of sexually violent predators. How did that come about? Very much so. Um, <laughs> As I recall, the the thing that really set that off uh, was the uh, case of a man up in Tacoma in a park who had, uh, I think he, the man actually severed the penis of a young boy, and it was it was so shocking, it was so such a grisly event uh, that. Uh, you only had to tell the story once, and people were shaking their heads saying, yeah, we, we, we've got to do something beyond well, the criminal prosecution. And uh, so what we what we did in the office, we drafted a law, we drafted a bill that provided that uh, in extreme cases like the one I'm re recounting, the... Um, state could bring a charge that this person ought to be locked up notwithstanding a criminal prosecution. And that even in fact after they had served a term that they could still be locked up and subject to uh, to uh, preventive re re rehabilitation. And uh, as a matter of fact I sold this idea to uh, member other members, other attorneys general from other states and and their question was, well, weren't you sued? Weren't you challenged on that statute? I said, you're darn right we were. And we defended it. And as a matter of fact, that particular law, we uh, we handed it to a, to a governor's commission that was, was dealing with that issue. And the legislature passed it. And we defended that law clear to the U.S. Supreme Court and successfully so, I'm proud to say. So... Um also, in your tenure, you focus on some other areas. Um, talk about a couple of any, any others you want to focus on. But consumer protection, that always seems to be a focus of, of the Attorney General's Attorneys General. Tell us about how you, some yeah. of the issues with that or how you viewed that set yeah. of issues. Yeah. Well, to be candid, uh, I was skeptical about consumer protection laws uh, as I came into office. I felt like it was a case of the nanny state uh, sticking its nose into areas that it had no business uh, doing. But <clears throat> the more I watched the operation of the office, the more I saw volunteers willing to commit their time to receiving complaints, uh, the more I saw of specific cases that uh, the Consumer Protection Division was handling. Uh, the more I had to agree that, yeah, there was this was an area of the law that really uh, needed a champion, if I can use that word. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did expand it. Uh, we, uh, and I'm very, in fact, I personally was involved in uh, local meetings and conferences, usually with an attorney from the Consumer Protection Division shop uh, around the state. And another interesting area related to that was the uh, trust division within the consumer protection. And because I'd inherited, I'd inherited a uh, lawsuit that uh, from Slade Gorton against several major oil companies, and in, in the lawsuit involved a uh, a. Uh, Secret, what am I trying to say? A, a uh, witness that, whose name was Secret from within the co one of the companies. Whistleblower. Yeah, a, well, a whistleblower, that's yeah. exactly right. And, except we were maintaining that this name, person's name had to be Secret because he was still employed with the company. 
and the uh, federal district court in Los Angeles, where one part of this was pending, demanded that, uh, and our lawyers had said that I was the one, only one who had the combination of the safe where the identity mm -hmm. was uh, reposing. Mm -hmm. And so he demanded that I personally appear before him and reveal the name. I refused to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, at this, this was at the, this happened at the very time that I was being sworn into the U.S. Supreme Court, with my sponsor being then brand new state U.S. Senator Slade Gorton. Mm -hmm. So Slater and, the, and I are there in the courtroom, along with several other AGs that are being sworn in on the same day. And it crossed my mind to wonder, I wonder how these guys would react on the bench if they knew that at this very moment I was in contempt of district court <laughs> in Los Angeles. I don't think they would have yeah. even seen the humor. <laughs> so I didn't bring it up. Yeah. But anyway, we... Uh, we, we finally resolved that case. Another area of protecting consumer interests is one that I'm somewhat familiar with because in the latter part, of the last term of your office, I was in the Utilities and Transportation Division. And uh, related to that was um, the Office of Public Counsel, which is the ratepayer advocate for the state of Washington, which by statute is a function assigned to the Attorney General. And prior to your tenure as Attorney General, that was done on a hit and miss basis with special assistant attorneys general. But you formalized that office, and tell us about what led to that. I did uh, formalize the office, and of course it was in response to suggestions being made by the lawyers in that office and uh, doing that work, uh, the lead attorney being uh, Chuck Adams. And um, uh, I have to acknowledge that uh, this whole incident was brought to mind by the fact the, a letter that you a copy of a letter you provided to me that I'd written to Ed Donahoe, who was at, at the time I wrote it in 1983, was the uh, lead scribe for the Teamsters Union. In fact, he'd been a long time uh, uh, representative for the Teamsters Union. And in fact, it goes way back to the first time I ran for the legislature when, when uh, he was told that. And believed that I was a, I would always vote the union line, and he was became very disenchanted with me because I did not. So you created the office of public counsel, and, and uh, the letter was a letter to him announcing this fact. And uh, yeah, uh, Chuck Adams and Rob Manifold right. were very successful in the work that they did uh, for the Utilities Commission. And you worked there also. That's right. That's right. No, I and worked with Chuck and worked with Rob quite a bit. So shifting gears somewhat, so the um, uh, one of the main functions of the Attorney General's office is to issue um, Attorney General's opinions, and uh, as I recall, you said earlier when we talked earlier that you had some innovations in how to how to do Attorney General opinions, at least in one or two instances. Uh, yes, <laughs> the uh, well, I think uh, the most spectacular case was one where the uh, U.S. Supreme Court had issued an opinion on uh, on abortion, and of course, uh, people locally were demanding to know if the if the Washington State Attorney General's office was going to enforce it one way or the other. And uh, of course, we were. <laughs> if you ever run for office, it's you not going to happen. <laughs> you would know. <laughs> That if you're, especially if you're a Republican, there, there's going to be some reporter who will call up and get you on the line and hold you there for a good three quarters or an hour or longer. And at some point they'll ask about abortion. You know, you, it may be that your office had nothing to do with abortion, yeah. but they're yeah. going to ask it because it's on the checkoff list. Anyhow, uh, in this case, we uh, asked the competing interests out there to submit uh, or said we'd be grateful to receive uh, your draft of how the opinion should read. And uh, that just made it easier to then strike one that we thought the law requires. So in we in effect, you, you, you asked for briefs from interested parties. We did. And make us briefs. A, a precisely. Yeah. And, and that worked out in that case and other cases as well? 
It did, uh, particularly in that case. Uh, I don't recall that we had others that were quite as contentious, mm -hmm. but we did. We did, we did have um, uh, competing interests quite often. Thanks for listening to this AGO Moment in History. Be sure to like and subscribe to receive updates when we upload a new episode. On our next episode, the last episode with General Eikenberry, he discusses the highlights of his time at the AGO. Thanks. Talk to you again soon.